Uncertainty is a great, great cause of anxiety. I mean, that sets you up for failure. You know, we can be our own worst critics, especially when things are not going so well in our lives. Just act. Just go in the direction you want to move. What does transcending give me? This book is an excuse to stop and actually do some of that inner work and that reflection and say, wow, what have I been through? It's a direction, not a destination. It's a North Star, not a goal. Growth is possible. Today, I speak with Scott Barry Kaufman and Jordan Feingold. Together, they wrote the practical guide, Choose Growth, which is a toolkit for turning your challenging times into the springboard you need to heal, get good insight, and start fresh. Jordan, this one is for you. Why is growth something that you have to choose? Mm, Yes, so like many things in life, a lot of choices are made for us and There are so many things that we can't decide about our existence. And among the few things that we can choose, it's really the direction of our lives and getting out of just letting things happen to us, but being active participants in our own growth journeys. I think that when the pandemic hit and we were inspired to write this book to help people think about how they actually might use the experiences of COVID to foster some sense of forward movement and making some deliberate changes, we were also confronted with all the the helplessness that people were feeling and the lack of control over so much. So uh, we offer this as a choice that is available to everyone, even if it may not seem available given the circumstances (laughs) we've been in. You know, as a parent, as someone who's been asking a lot of really big questions over the last few years and, and speaking to experts like you, I kind of get the sense that, you know, the old line, like no one gets out of life alive, right? Like, yes. I feel like no one gets out of adolescence and teenage years without some form of trauma. It's like I either, you know, had too much money or not enough money. I was too smart. I wasn't smart enough. I was too athletic. I wasn't athletic enough. Like you could just always pick the opposite. Mm -hmm. And especially as a parent where it's like, we want to make sure our kids have the things that we didn't have. But meanwhile, we're ignoring all, all these other things. It's just, there's no way through this. Is that idea, is that, um, is that fairly accurate that pretty much all of us have something that we should be facing, something that we need to deal with, something that's holding us back from becoming the person that we could become. Like, is that pretty universal? Or am I just prescribing this to everyone, but it's not the case? Yes, I think that we all do. Um, and I, I don't like viewing suffering as a competition at all. That's just not how I view things. You know, like, I think we need to honor everyone's experience. Um, you have no idea the pain someone could, uh, the depth of the pain someone can go through, no matter how seemingly privileged they may seem on the outside. You know, to reduce someone just to their privilege uh, and, and and deny them of their suffering, I think, is horrible. Or um, just to their suffering and deny them of all of the gifts and potentialities they have. That is hell yes end. That's a hell yes end. Uh, my answer to your question is yes. It would be a wonderful world, in my view, if we spent a lot more time uh, validating the real experiences of others um, without and feeling like we need to fight a competition to have our suffering be heard the most. And so how do we all recognize this and accept this without falling into victimhood, which, which, which is (laughs) so (laughs) comfortable. (laughs) Like it's really a great place to live. (laughs) Boom. There we go. I mean, I think like all the things we equip people with in this book are, are in a way it's not specifically designed. Like that wasn't our framing of it, but in a way, if you apply these principles, you are going to be most likely to be able to choose the growth option in your life as opposed to stay stuck in a certain mentality that is holding yourself back when you don't need to. Yeah, it's about empowerment and and not denying or suppressing the parts of the experience of our lives that need a lot of work and are big pain points and sources of existential distress. It's like we need to say hello and honor those things too, rather than just tuck them into the depths of our consciousness. So I think it's about doing that and welcoming in some of these anxieties and stressors and the dark side of our human experience, maybe not 24 seven. We actually have a line in the book. It's like, how do we invite some of this dark side into our kitchen for lunch on Tuesday, rather than just as a house guest that never leaves. Mm -hmm. And also really cultivating those parts of our experience, our strengths, the ability to savor positive experiences and positive states of being that will by default 
enhance our experience of living this life. And, and it's that full spectrum, acknowledging and figuring out where we can empower ourselves to actually move the needle and to move forward. I think that we can, you know, that inherently gets us out of that victimhood mentality because it's action oriented. And that's when I think the, the transcendence emerges. Help me understand. I need to transcend. What does that actually mean? Like, I understand I want to find my purpose. I understand I want freedom. I want to be happier. I want to make more money. You know, maybe these sound like marketing terms, but I can understand them. What does transcending give me? What does it give our listener, a person who works through the book? You're asking me questions about my book, Transcend, uh, which I'm happy to talk about. But I would argue that the main topic of the book that Jordan well, wrote... Hold on, hold on. Chapter 8, Become a Transcender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's this like the point. It's, it's the destination we arrive at, right? No, well, it's never a destination. It's a direction, not a destination. It's a North Star, not a goal. The point there is that there's so much integration required before you get to that in terms of like as an emergence. It's an emergent property. Transcendence is something that... that that just comes along for the ride of growth. So I don't think growth is the is synonymous with transcendence. And so the idea is you could ask us like, what is growth? You know, and that might be a, a more tangible way to, to, to deal with this at, at, in the, in the moment. Um, because transcendence I see is this great integration that emerges when you feel your sail, you know, using my sailboat metaphor, the sail is fully open. It's like hello world and you feel safe, you feel secure, you feel connected, you feel um, secure in your self-esteem where if someone says something to you, you don't like, you know, about yourself, you can, it can just come bounce off you like bullets, you know, and you have spirit of exploration, creativity, um, you know where you're sailing to, you have this purpose and you're just living your purpose day after day after day. Like that's uh, I have this whole section called live your purpose and, and transcend. When you're doing all these things, you know, like transcendence is the thing that all that makes possible. I want all that stuff. So you just sold me on it, right? It's like, I want my sail to be full. I want to know my destination. I want to know what I'm working towards and my purpose and my strengths. And I want self-esteem. I mean, I was going to... I'm so glad you brought that up. Because in the book, there are all, all these different chapters. And what caught my eye the most working through this was, okay, live your purpose. Cool. We're going to find out what our values are. You know, we're going we're gonna to figure out what the legacy could be. We're going to understand our strengths. Again, a lot of stuff that's just really good workable tools. But the fact that chapter 3 is about developing a healthy self-esteem so early on in the process, I don't see a lot of other people talking about this. And we talk about confidence and we talk about growth and we talk about mindset and abundance versus scarcity. And we talk mm -hmm. about all the, all the things we need to do, right? I'm in the entrepreneur world. I'm in the creative world. It's like, we're all yeah. um, high achievers. We all want more and more and more and more. And yet I didn't know until about a year ago how important self-esteem was. And I didn't realize that I had such a low self-esteem of myself because <laughs> everyone's like, you're super confident. It's like, that's me just projecting. Mm -hmm. You don't realize how... It, Desperately insecure, I feel sometimes, oh. and so it was curious to me how early on you you move this into the into your process. Yeah, there's no such thing as a low self esteem. Interestingly enough, um, it's just high self esteem or insecure self esteem. Um, it's just uncertain. So all all you're saying is you have a self esteem that maybe isn't that like is uncertain. Like it really draws a lot of energy and strength from your external validation, you know, and what people say to you. So is is that do you resonate with that? Like if people are like. Mark, you're the best. Like, do you, does that pump you up for? I had for myself, I had to learn to first accept compliments. Mm -hmm. There you go. And I just started practicing like, like years ago. I was just like, someone, I don't know if it's my friend, Evan Carmichael, someone said, like, they gave me a compliment and I didn't accept it. And they called me on it and said, that's insulting. <laughs> you know, when I'm giving you a gift, you accept the gift. Yep. You don't try to pay me back. You don't try to make it even. You don't try... Like you just accept the gift. And so I started by just saying, I will accept your compliment like as a mechanical thing. And then once I started accepting compliments, I started realizing, oh, people are like really like... They're all, they're all kind of saying the same thing. Maybe I should just believe them. Maybe they see something I don't see. And then that started to help me. But why I wanted to dig into self-esteem and, and Jordan, I'd love to hear from you on this as well is... I think the answer it, so many people are given is just believe, like believe more. Like if you just have a, a vision and you work towards it and you believe it will come true, it will come true. But yeah. it's so hard to believe in things when you don't necessarily believe in yourself. 
or if we don't have evidence to support that, that belief is truly getting us anywhere. I think when we talk about self-esteem, we're talking about self-worth, believing we are worthy. So I think that's where belief and having really great role models and having love early on in our lives, people viewing us and giving us that message, we are worthy. And then there's this mastery component of it too, that we actually want to be doing things that are in line with our goals. And we actually want to make a dent in the world and be working towards something and to see some results. And belief may help you with some of that self-worth, but with mastery, you want to see results. And, and because we're not always going to, you know, I'm a physician. Every medical student fails at something, whether it's feeling super awkward in their first patient encounter or literally failing a test. Like failure is a part of the human experience, right? We all do it and it's part of growth and it could be really great fuel for growth. But in those moments when we fail, is that going to be totally shattering to our whole self image? Or can we offer ourselves some self compassion and say, this is part of my growth. I am human. This is part of the process. So we take it a step further in terms of just like the self worth and mastery and then bring in the self compassion piece. So how do I meet myself in those moments when it feels really hard to, to feel masterful? And so I have to ask then, you know, how do you do that? You said like, how does one do this? Yep. So how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. So I think, first of all, it's recognizing that for various reasons, some of us may be more sensitive to these failures, to feelings worthy in general, and securing our self-esteem in in those senses based on our personal history takes a lot of time. I think that a lot of that is more of a long-term process, like in a therapeutic setting or with a coach, like long-term, like we're not going to solve that in a day. But self-compassion is a skill. It's really like working a muscle that I think the, if I'm going to boil it down to one thing, it would be like, what would I actually say to someone I really love who's going through the feelings that I'm going through right now? Um, what would I say to a friend? And Kristen Neff and Chris Germer are like, the self-compassion guru people. And they have so, so much great work about mindful self-compassion. And really, I think, you know, they're the, they talk about the three components. So there's the mindfulness, not over-identifying with our own suffering. There's common humanity, recognizing that we are part of a shared experience, that what we are going through is not necessarily happening to us alone. Other people have been there. And the self-kindness piece, just, you know, we can be our own worst critics, especially when things are not going so well in our lives. So how do we bring that kindness that it's frankly easier to cultivate for other people oftentimes than it is to cultivate for ourselves? And I think that provides a really uh, supportive structure for us in times of hardship when our self-esteem may just be a little bit less secure than we would like it to be. Yeah. Jordan, um, for this book, made this move that I thought was really sensible, which is including self-compassion as a huge antidote to low self-esteem or uncertain self-esteem. It bottomless, like you can, you constantly can use it any time that you want and treat yourself as a friend. But also there's a lot of people when they think about self-compassion, they don't realize it has multiple components to it. I mean, it's a multidimensional construct, <laughs> as they say in psychology. And one of the aspects of it is finding the common humanity in what you're going through and what other people are going through. And so when something happens to you, you say, well, my gosh, like I'm going to give myself some care here, just as like I would give someone else care who is going through the same exact thing, because it's very common to feel this way when treated this way by others or, or whatever happened to you, you know, so there's a real strong common humanity element as well as a self kindness element to it. This is really, really fascinating because I, I've, I have found that I learned the greatest lessons when parenting, mm. you know, like I'll turn to my son and I'll be like, how could you do this? That's it. And then I later in the day, I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm basically following the same habits. You know, like I'm really focused on diet. So I'm like, I'm fasting and I'm not eating. And then meanwhile, I'm telling my kids like, you need to eat more and blah, 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 and have all of this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I'm not modeling the best behavior. I think I've done it. I like the idea of going, okay, I've made this mistake or I've had this challenge or I've had this setback or I have fear or self-doubt. I think in my head, I would naturally go, Mark, you're a piece of you know, like this just proves why you can't do it. This just proves how terrible you are. Mm -hmm. And I would really start to be like, you deserve failure or a mm -hmm. self-sabotage. If I'm being really honest, yeah. uh, I don't know if everyone does this. I do this. But yet when it comes to 
me thinking of a coworker or a family friend or my kids, like them coming to me earnestly saying, I have just made this mistake and I am, I, I'm so sorry, or I don't know what to do, or I'm in trouble, or I need help. But like if my heart would melt instantly, mm-hmm. it wouldn't matter what they had done. I would be like, let's figure this out. It's not the end of the world. Life will go on. It's, you're going to have, you're going to have to suck it up. It's going to be really hard, yeah. but you'll get through this and we'll get through it together. Like as soon as it's someone else, it's yeah. just like, oh my goodness, I'm, my heart melts for them. But for myself, it's just like, you piece of sh-. Why did you think mm-hmm. you could do this? Do you know what I mean? I think that experience is quite common. And okay, so I'm not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. And part of that common humanity is recognizing that even in the way we respond to ourselves, we can be self compassionate, right? Like we could say, you know, Mark, that is part of a common experience. And then you can start to internalize that and say, wow that internal dialogue I have where I'm telling myself I'm such an asshole, that is because I am human. And maybe that can take away some of the emotional valence and some of the baggage associated with that natural default response, such that you practice that enough over time that isn't your default response anymore. And so have have you, I mean, obviously you guys are, I mean, Jordan, you're a, a practitioner or a clinician or whatever term we would use. So you work with people and you help them through this and God, you know, you've, you're a PhD and you dedicate your life to, to creating great content and what have you, but this is real. It works. Like this whole idea of like, catch it, flag it, try to be self-soothing, try to figure this out. And then over time, you'll just find one day you just don't think that way anymore. Like, like we can, we can, we can grow, we can change, right? Well, you know, it's, it, it, well, hold on. It's not that you don't think it anymore. It's that you change your relationship to those thoughts. I think that's a really important distinction. You know, I still have the same thoughts I used to have when I used to fear flying, but I have those thoughts and I'm much more compassionate to those thoughts. I'm much more um, uh, detached from those thoughts. I don't personalize it so much. I don't feel like I need to act on them, right? Um, so I don't. I'm not convinced that the the goal is to completely inhibit or suppress because that usually makes it worse. The more that you mm-hmm. try to like squash the thoughts down or become shameful of those thoughts, and that's not helping anything. I feel like you're still at the stage where you're shameful of your thoughts, <laughs> uh, or you're almost you're being so harsh. You're you're being so harsh to yourself, even just right now, uh, that you have such thoughts, as opposed to just getting to the point where you're like, wow, sometimes I, I think to myself, um, what a loser when I, when I, when something goes wrong. Um, but then I watch myself say that. And I then think to myself, well, but I, I'm not a loser, you know, like there's an extra stage you can go through there. So walk me through that, you know, last night, um, I was, I was, you know, having a great time or whatever, but I had this realization where it's just like, I, I'm a little bit nervous with some stuff that we're doing in the business. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're trying to do things very differently than my comfort zone. And so uh, I'm nervous with some investments we're making. I'm in, I'm nervous about timelines. I'm nervous about money. I'm nervous, like, can we do it? Can our team do it? Can we step up? Can we deliver? All of the regular entrepreneur nerves. Sure. And yesterday was my 16th anniversary for my company that I started. And so I had to almost take a step back and, and go like, I've been in business for 16 years. You know, most people maybe don't make it till five. And I've gone through three recessions and I've gone through building a multi-million dollar team and then shrinking a team. And I've gone through iteration after iteration. And I'm totally comfortable in what we're doing and totally confident in what we're doing. And I know it's going to grow. And like, I had to like talk myself through all of these reminders. Mm. Is, is this the answer to getting over flying or any other fear or self-doubt or things that may be holding us back? Well, Mark, what I just heard you do is you shifted the perspective, you shifted the frame so that you were first, the anxiety was really zoomed in on the upcoming future and everything that's ahead and the nitty gritty, all of these things you're in the midst of and all of the uncertainty surrounding those things. And then you zoomed out to really change your perspective of the last 16 years and how you're in this tiny, tiny little window of this much longer career where you know there's much less uncertainty. You are certain you have been doing this well in the last 16 years. You have pivoted. So what you've done is you're looking for evidence four ways that you've been successful in this space, which I always think is good to find some facts. Like, do I have reason to be this anxious? 
you recognized, and maybe you're asking for help on this, and we'll tell you, uncertainty is a great, great cause of anxiety and of all of this fear. So it makes sense that you are feeling insecure right now about some of these things. And then we'll add another layer on top of it is that that anxiety is probably adaptive in some way. It's preventing you from making really silly choices. It is keeping you afloat in your business. And it's probably something, if you're having it now, there have been points over those last 16 years where you felt some anxiety. And we can think about how that has served you in the past. And we can think about, thank you, anxiety for trying to help me in my business. And we can also think in what ways is this anxiety actually inhibiting me from being fully present in my life right now, from not making choices that I ought to serve my business and my family. And and most importantly, um, I think, how is this, like, is this anxiety serving me? In what ways is it? And if it's not, how can I distance myself in the way that you have? Yeah, Mark, you, so what's wrong with being apprehensive? There are unknowns, right? Like the opposite, like being overconfident and being arrogant. I mean, that, that sets you up for failure. Waiting and doing nothing is something all of us are pretty comfortable with. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think yeah. the opposite to taking this action is doing nothing, in fact. <laughs> um, I see what you're saying. I do see what you're saying. Well, it sounds like you're certainly taking actions uh, despite, you know, the way the apprehensiveness you have. So you're, you're still able to kind of, you're still able to take action. I'm trying, but what I hope we can layer over now with, you know, I'm going to move us a few steps from an analogy point of view, but hopefully we don't lose people. All the uncertainty that you've talked about and all the stuff that's happening in my business is true. And it's as a result of, you know, hey, we had this great big pandemic and COVID and all this stuff that I think most people are tired of hearing about. (laughs) But we can't deny that at least in my life, for my generation, I'm turning 40, like I'm one of the older kind of millennials, but... Mm. Perhaps other than maybe the uncertainty of September 11th, the the most uncertain thing that's ever happened in my lifetime. And for all of us who are listening, we've had to go through something that short of like maybe my grandfather's generation, you know, the World War, maybe Vietnam. Like there have been very few of these types of really, really scary moments, maybe the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so we've had this moment of uncertainty. I believe that what you guys have put together is an answer, is an anecdote. It's or an anecdote? No, an antidote. Yeah. It, is, it is something where I still feel, I struggle with this thing. Like, I don't know if you guys, like I've heard of this term prison time, mm. right? Where like what we experienced where there, where there was not a lot of things happening. And I feel like the f- two years have kind of blended into mm-hmm. one another. This is what prisoners experience in prison because there's nothing to make any day remarkable. And so your brain only tends to note remarkable things, I believe, I've been told. And so if nothing remarkable happens from day to day, your brain just goes, oh, okay, this was an everyday thing. And it literally just forgets it or just moves on. And so for those like me who are struggling to say like, did the last two years happen? The last three years happen? Are we going back to the way it was before? Is this a brand new world? And when does the new world start? I keep waiting for like this gun to go off to be like, the race has started again. And yet like we're fa- like... We're in a new year, right? We're in a brand new year. It's 2023. I, I can't believe how much time's happening. So I don't know how you take the uncertainty we felt and, and everything I've just said and layer it over <laughs> with why we need to work through this process. But I'll throw it back to you with no question asked at all. I think that for most people, we, ha- we may have these questions. We may be feeling all of the things that you are feeling. And there's no impetus to, there's always going to be something more pressing than investing in our personal growth, (laughs) right? Like it's the project at work, like all of these immediate things emerging back into the, the parties and the gatherings and social life. And there's always going to be something that is a priority over our own commitment to ourselves. Mm. And I think that This has affected all of us in profound ways and in different ways. But because it's happened to everyone, I think it's so easy to say, well, why focus so much on it? This is, you know, that common humanity piece, but kind of gone too far. Like, this is something that we've all gone through. Like, poor me, like relative to other people, I was actually pretty unscathed. And we can actually really minimize the extent to which we were impacted by this. And because for lots of us, it was in really subtle ways, the way we um, maybe started to fear personal contact or the way our love and dating lives were put on hold. But all of us experienced this in different ways. And I think 
it's so tempting and easy to just move forward and just race head on into the to the present and the future. And this book is an excuse to stop and actually do some of that inner work and that reflection and say, wow, what have I been through? How is this affecting me? And how can I actually make some connections with other people uh, through, through this process of unpacking and then moving forward? Yeah, this is, we're basically saying this is an opportunity for reflection it, to a degree that you probably have never done in your entire life. I mean, to what degree have you, Mark, ever been this piercingly honest with yourself about your low self-esteem or your, or your uncertain self-esteem and your desire to change it? I mean, another thing we talk about in this book, you know, or the, or the surveys we ask people to take are necessarily come out, you are great, you know, like all those other books that sell so many copies. You know, we may ask you to, to reflect on whether or not you're a vulnerable narcissist. You know, or do you, maybe you score high in vulnerable narcissism. Maybe you, you know, like your arrogance, uh, not you, Mark, but I'm saying you, the reader of our book, maybe your arrogance is getting in the way of reaching your goals. Whatever is getting in the way of you self-actualizing, we want to help you really reflect on. I'll say we're here when you're ready. You know, this book isn't going anywhere and I don't want to rush anyone to come to this journey when they are not feeling like they can like we we you know we offer a ton of science in here to sort of give the evidence that these changes are possible that growth is possible that we are all growing throughout the course of the lifespan and that there is no version of ourselves that is so fixed and unmodifiable that we can't be working towards bettering ourselves and working towards that constantly evolving and dynamic sort of ideal version of ourselves which is not a single fixed thing. Mm. And in the work that I've done as a training psychiatrist, I know what it's like to want to, you know, see someone make a change and they're just not ready to do it. They're pre-contemplative. Mm. I would say just know we're here for you and that this book is here for you and it's not going anywhere. So when you're ready, open it up. And even if you're not ready, maybe some of the, I read it and maybe some of the ideas will enter your consciousness subconsciously and, you know, influence you in ways you might not even realize. Because honestly, I, I might be a little more tough love than Jordan sometimes. Um, uh-huh. I think with some people who are like, oh, I'm not, re- I'm going to stew in my bed all day. I'm not ready. I'm not going to get out. Sometimes you're like, okay, well, there's a whole thing in psychology called the behavioral activation technique. And it's you act when when you're not ready. Just act. Just go in the direction you want to move. If you take a, there's a whole study where they had people who were sad and they had them take a pencil and put it in their mouth so that they fake the smile, and they reported feeling happier at the end of the experiment. You know, like so. I don't know. Sometimes it's like maybe fake some of our our exercises. <laughs> I always think of those things because. My wife will see me on the treadmill smiling, but mostly it's just because it's just like, this feels so uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, I really want to go to the gym. I really want to like, you know, get in super, super shape, but I don't really want to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> you you know, want I, to want to go well, to the gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to want to. And I, sometimes I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I'm not ready for the gym. But but it is the best thing for me. And I know that at a certain level. And at a certain level, you have to still act even though you're not ready for it. That is- well, listen, oh. Oh, sorry, I was gonna say, listeners, this is We Do Hard Things. So like, we're not having conversations because it's gonna be simple or easy. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is take your medicine, it's good for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it really does go back to the two faces of self-compassion. The, and I'm bringing much more yin, tender, nurturing, loving kindness to that question of, you know, <laughs> let's, we're here for you when at your own terms. And then there's the yang of self-compassion that Neff talks about, the fierce mama bear turned inward that is saying, get off your ass. You know, this is good for you. And when we have a personal relationship, I'll give you all of that yang. But and I bet your (laughs) listeners who are who want to do hard things are looking for that uh, and, and more of Scott's tough love. So I think it's about holding both of those in the balance. 